Hello and welcome back to the Quiet Park Podcast. My name is Chris. How's everybody doing today? Got a few more segments to get to, so let's get right into it. But before I do, if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like button, that subscribe button, maybe even the notification bell. And if you're feeling really generous, leave a comment. Let's get to it. This from the Daily Mail. Ex-Trump campaign attorney Jenna Ellis told Georgia prosecutors then-president wanted to stay in White House after losing 2020 election, according to interviews after flipping and reaching plea agreements. Um, a former Trump campaign attorney has told Georgia prosecutors the former president's team vowed to keep him in the White House under any circumstances, despite losing the 2020 election. Well, I mean, she's not really saying anything different. I mean, that they truly believe that he should stay in the White House, and they thought that he had lost. As any time you have an election, you're allowed to challenge those results if you don't believe that they are accurate. I mean, you're not going to fight that challenge if you truly thought you lost. So, I mean, is she really saying anything important here? But, you know, I, I seem to remember her pretty, being pretty adamant, too. No, she was absolutely adamant, saying uh, th there was fraud, there was this. She, she believes the things she was saying, and she was saying that constitutionally they had a case. You know, she was saying those things. Was, was that just because, you know, she was coming from a legal perspective? Or was she believing what her boss said? At this point, I don't know. Jenna Ellis, 38, previously pleaded guilty to some charges in the election interference case. And as part of her plea deal, she she's now given details about the conversations which followed Trump's defeat. In a recorded interview with Fulton County investigators obtained by ABC News, Ellis recalled a conversation that she had with former White House social media director Dan Scavino on December 19, 2020, the month after Joe Biden was elected. I told him the claims and the ability to challenge the election results was essentially over, Ellis told investigators. He said to me in a kind of excited tone, we don't care and we're not going to leave. Well, I'm not seeing Trump say that. I mean... <laughs> Am I wrong in reading that? Let me see this one more time. She told social media director Dan Scavino that it was over and we don't care. We're not going to leave is what he said. I'm not seeing Trump say that. Um, but hey, we got a recording here. So let's go ahead and play that. Okay. And uh, at the time uh, period where they were going to start to discuss, what was uh, Dan Scavino's role? At the time, I believe his title was social media director for the White House. It became deputy chief of staff um, at the time that the conversation in question took place. Okay, and when was that? The conversation was around December 19th of 2020 uh, at the White House Christmas party. And I uh, emphasized to him, I thought that the um, the, the claims and the ability to challenge uh, the election results was essentially over because he said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the boss, meaning President Trump and everyone understood the boss. Um, that's what we all called him. Um, he said the boss uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And he said, we don't care. All right. Pretty interesting stuff there. Um, I mean, it, it'd be nice if I had a recording of that actual conversation and other evidence, because I do remember, again, at that time, e even past that point, she was adamant that they were still, they still had avenues to go down. I, I do remember those media accounts. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the boss, meaning, okay. So this is the rest of that comment. Um, her testimony provides insight into what cooperating defendants could be telling prosecutors about how Trump's inner circle dealt with defeat in 2020. At the time, the president himself was making wild allegations about the results being fake, despite his own campaign's official court challenges being rejected. You know, 
Tim Pool talks about this often, and it's important to point out. Yes, those campaign ch election challenges were defeated, but not on the merits of the case. They were thrown out because they said he didn't have standing. He didn't have standing to challenge the results. He didn't have standing to challenge the things that were put in place in the buildup to the election that were illegal or against other states' constitutions. In the cases where he actually got to present the case and the merits, he overwhelmingly won those. And this is the thing the media has been doing. They're telling everyone, no, he lost all his core challenges, and that's not the case. Simply put, the cases where it was big, prominent conversations being happening, they were thrown out on lack of standing, not on lack of merit. And I think the biggest problem is we didn't have those cases go through the Supreme Court or any courts to say, hey, there is merit here. Let's hear what it actually is, as, as it should have been. But in the essence of time, we had to say, no, 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 you don't have standing. Be done with it. We don't want to touch this. Last month, Ellis broke down in tears and pleaded guilty to one count of aiding and abetting false statements and writing the Georgia case. She, she'd been facing more serious charges of violating the state's anti-racketeering law. The attorney avoided jail and was sent to, sentenced to five years probation, a $5,000 fine, and 100 hours of community service, and was also ordered to write an apology letter to the people of Georgia. All right, that, that's just wrong. Why is she writing an apology letter to the people of Georgia? I mean... That, that's wrong on all sorts of levels. I mean, what, what benefit is that? Uh, guys, I'm sorry that I told you these things that I believed at the time and my boss believed at the time. And I really thought I was fighting the correct fight. But yeah, it was all BS. I mean, the, the, the public just wants their pound of flesh and they're not even going to care about that. She, she was also ordered to testify truthfully in any trials related to the case, which could include giving evidence against Trump. It came days after two other former Trump lawyers, Sidney Powell and Kenneth Chesserborough, also struck deals and pleaded guilty to lesser charges. Ellis was indicted two months ago along with Trump, Powell, Chesborough, and more than a dozen other defendants who were accused in a sprawling criminal conspiracy to overturn Joe Biden's victory in Georgia. Ellis had been one of the most prominent voices in Trump's attempts to challenge the 2020 election results, appearing frequently on television, pushing claims of voter fraud. Addressing the court through tears, Ellis blamed her crime on more experienced lawyers she had worked with on behalf of Trump. During that time, she worked closely with Rudy Giuliani, the former New York mayor who was Trump's personal lawyer, although she did not name Giuliani in her statement. Ellis sobbed as she told the court, I'm an attorney who is also a Christian. I take my responsibilities as a lawyer very seriously. I relied on others, including lawyers, with many, many more years of experience to provide me with true and reliable information. See, and this is the problem. She's getting out of this by saying, I relied on others for information. As a lawyer, you're supposed to go get that information yourself. You're supposed to be able to determine what you're being told is being considered as accurate and truthful and if you believe that you you take the case you fight the cause and she she was a very prominent voice with all things constitutional related including election laws apparently and she was very very adamant in her support of trump what actually happened was she concerned she was actually going to lose this i think if they would have stood strong i mean they had a much better chance of beating it uh, in my opinion, but you know, when they all crumble like this, what, what are they giving up and are they doing it just to save themselves or are they, you know, doing it for, you know, their conscience, their, their belief that, you know, I did wrong and I will have to fix it. You know, I, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I honestly believe that it's the former, they're, they're doing it to get themselves out of trouble, and that's it. I mean, here, here's a video where she's talking about those things, and I'm not going to play it, but she she's talking very adamantly about the fact that she did the, 
she believed what she was saying and Trump was right. And yeah. Okay, especially since my role in speaking to the media and to the legislators in various states. What I did not do, but I should have done, Your Honor, was to make sure that the facts the other lawyers alleged to be true were in fact true. As I said, that's her job. Uh, wiping away tears, she added, in the frantic pace of attempting to raise challenges to the election in several states, including Georgia, I failed to do my due diligence. I believe in and I value election integrity, and if I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. Alice went on to tell the court she felt deep remorse and added, I apologize to the people of Georgia. Well, I'm pretty sure they said a written letter, but, you know, go ahead and poly- apologize, you know, in, in a video statement. That, that, that'll suffice, right? Because they're going to let her off because she's giving up the goods. This is the problem. They're not going to care about that apology as long as she gives them valuable information they think is going to actually win in court. I don't think it will. But, hey, go right ahead. Save yourself. I'm, yeah, I'll see you in the next segment. Hey, everyone. Before I get into my outro, do you still love the iconic sci-fi and space opera franchises but feel like they took a wrong turn along the way? Then the new journey of the Starscape Chronicles eagerly awaits you. Escape to the Starscape. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Yes, today I am talking about a book series from a friend of mine, Jeremiah McRoberts. Uh, He's got seven books already written and more to come. Uh, For that, I just simply want you to visit www.starscapechronicles.com to check out the books, ebooks, and links to free audiobooks. Currently, there are seven books built in the Starscape universe from different perspectives. Together, they establish a galaxy of ongoing adventures that will continue for decades to come. Seriously, everyone, I I recommend everyone check this out. I personally will be doing the same thing. This is a veteran-owned small business. Uh, If you're listening to me, you know that I like Tim Pool. And one of the things Tim Pool says a lot is stop giving your money to people that hate you. Jeremiah here does not hate you. And he'd be happy to entertain you and keep you enthralled for hours to come and what is a great series. Uh, Go ahead and check it out. All right. Thank you for tuning in. If you like that content and want more of it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Leave a comment. Uh, These are all things that tell me that you like what you see and you want more of it. Um, Beyond that, you can find me at RealChrisNoski on Twitter. You can find me at Patreon.com, The Quiet Part Pod. There I will be uploading additional content, stuff you will not find on YouTube. Uh, It should be a great time. Check it out. Thank you.